Today, we take a look at the Minnesota Vikings in their 2000... Wait. Why the hell am I looking at the Vikings? That team is nothing but a steaming pile of... Score! Crossy Posse Packer Nation, welcome to an episode of Packcast, the podcast where you don't have to be a Packers fan, but it sure does help. I'm your host, Tom Grassi, and today, sadly, begrudgingly, we are taking a look at the Minnesota Vikings draft, and we're going to put a grade on it. But before we get to that, I want to do a big shout-out and thank you to all my patrons over at patreon.com slash Tom Grassi Comedy. If you would like to support me and get some cool rewards, check that out. Now, yesterday we did the Bears, Monday we did the Packers, and so it was either the purple incarnations of Satan or the Lions, and eh, we'll just wait for Thursday for the Lions, just like the Lions are going to wait to ever be relevant. And so uh, we're going to go through this in case you're brand new here. We're going to go through day by day. I'll give each day a grade, and we'll go uh, pick by pick and kind of analyze and break them down a little bit. So starting with day one, the Minnesota Vikings own the number 18th pick of the 2019 NFC draft and go- NFC, what the f- NFL draft and they needed to fill a hole and that hole was on their offensive line in which they needed help, lots and lots of help. And with the number 18 pick, the Minnesota Vikings drafted Garrett Bradbury, the six foot three, 306 pound center from NC state. Now, when, when he was drafted, we were live streaming at the time. I, I thought there was better people on the board. I mean, you had Cody Ford for one. You also had Reisner, who I thought was better. Uh, but they went with Bradbury, and it obviously fills a massive need. This guy is going to be a day one starter. They needed significant help, especially at center. He has played 13 games at left guard in 2016 and 2017, but he played the center in 2018, where he won the Remington Trophy for the nation's top center. And so, obviously, this is going to dramatically help the Minnesota Vikings. And the 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 knocks against Bradbury is obviously he is a little bit on the smaller side. He is a good athlete. Uh, again, I think that there were better people. Uh, even at this position that the Vikings could have gone with, but at least they're addressing their number one need. So for their day one uh, grade, I'm going to give them an A- minus because just like I said, I think Bradbury is going to be a good player for them. I just think there was better people on the board. Uh, and so with that, that's what the little knock is for an A-. minus. But so far, so good for the Minnesota Vikings. Yay. Then going on to day two, in which the Minnesota Vikings had dose picks. Their first pick at number 50 was Irv Smith Jr., the tight end from Alabama, who's sitting at 6'2", 242 pounds. His stats in 2017 played nine games, had 14 receptions for 128 yards, averaging about 9.1 yards per catch, and had three touchdowns, so very limited in production. And then in 2018, played 15 games, had 44 receptions, 710 yards, 16.1 average per catch, and seven touchdowns. Now, for Alabama, he was a good mismatch, and I'm not going to put his lack of productivity all on Irv Smith Jr. because Alabama was used to blowing out teams last year. And so he also ran a 4.63 40-yard dash, which is okay for the position, but he doesn't have a ton of experience. He definitely needs to improve in run blocking. Um, but this is also going to be a need for the Vikings. This is Kyle Rudolph's contract year, who has 41 touchdowns in his entire career uh, and over 3,700 yards, but in 2018 had 64 receptions, 634 yards, and only four touchdowns. And I mean... As a Packers fan, I constantly remember Rudolph just catching everything that is thrown to him. This is going to give a nice weapon for Kirk Cousins. That being said, though, Irv Smith Jr., again, his lack of experience, and he does need to work on a couple of key items, especially when you're having a shaky offensive line, and that's being complimentary. Uh, the fact that this guy also can't run black is a little bit problematic, but maybe him sitting behind Kyle Rudolph for about a year or rotating with him will do him some good. And then at number 102, they got Alexander Madison, the running back from Boise State, sitting at 5'11", 221 pounds. 
In 2016, for 67 attempts, he had 328 yards, averaging 4.9 yards per carry, four touchdowns, then had five receptions for 54 yards. In 2017, his production went way, way up and had 212 attempts for 1,086 yards, averaging 5.1 yards per carry, 12 touchdowns, 28 receptions, 284 yards, and one touchdown. And finally... In 2018, 302 attempts for over 1,400 yards at 1,415, 4.7 yards per carry, 17 touchdowns, 27 receptions, and for 173 yards. So just from these stats alone and taking a little bit of a look at his tape, the guy is obviously a workhorse back, evident in the fact that he ran the ball over 300 times last year. He's had, he had 514 attempts over two years. Those are crazy numbers, and it shows on the tape that he has good patience, but at the same time, this is kind of like the opposite of the Herb Smith Jr. problem in that while he has all of this experience, like he, he's got some mileage under him. Like Him getting over 500 carries in two years, going to put some wear on the tread on the tires there. Um, he's not really explosive. He doesn't make great, great cuts. A lot of the tape I looked at and a lot of the analysts that I looked at was like, he's a runner. It's nothing flashy. He just runs and thing it gets it done. I mean, like, that's not really much of a compliment, so I don't think you're going to get, like, an explosive player out of this. But considering Dalvin Cook in 2018 had 133 attempts, ran 615 yards, two touchdowns, and then 40 receptions, 305 yards, and two touchdowns. Not the production I think Vikings fans were looking for, especially coming back from his injury. I know before he got injured, the Vikings fans were like, oh my God, this guy's going to be amazing. What, everything that I saw, he was going to be amazing. And so they're going to hope that Dalvin Cook's able to bounce back from this injury. But I don't know how much Madison is going to be able to provide like that good rotational like running back by committee thing. Cause again, there's nothing really flashy about him. When you want a running back by committee, you would think like you have Dalvin cook who has that explosiveness, but Madison's just gonna, he's, he's just gonna run. I'm not saying he's bad, but I wouldn't want him to be my premier back. Maybe on third down, but again, he's not going to give you that power. So I don't know. I'm kind of mixed about this pick. And so that being said, for day two, I'm going to give the Minnesota Vikings a score of a B. I think there was better people on the board, but you have a lack of experience in Herb Smith Jr., even though it does fill a need. And then Alexander Madison, I wouldn't feel super comfortable with him being the guy who could potentially take over for Dalvin Cook or who's going to be filling in just because there's nothing really about him that impresses me. I don't know how... I don't know how great of an NFL career Madison is going to have, especially when you're going to have defenders who are going to be able to make sure he can't just run. Then moving on to day three, where holy crap, could you have any more picks? I'm sitting here and I'm like, oh, okay, you know, like we'll look at like eight to 10 people. Nope. All the picks, all the picks, all the ones that the Packers didn't have, the Vikings got them. All the ones that the Bears have, the Vikings had them. For whatever reason, the Vikings were given a million freaking comp picks, and so let's go through them. So the first one at number 114, we have Drew Samia for the guard from Oklahoma, sitting at 6'5", 305 pounds. He's a four-year starter from Oklahoma, and some of the things that are obviously a positive is it addresses another need. He has quick feet. In 2015, he played right tackle, and then from 2016 to 2018, he played right guard. Now, some of the things that I was taking a look at and what some of the analysts were saying was that he needs to stay in front of defenders. In addition, he needs more power. And so because of that, he actually might have to play center to be successful in the NFL, which is problematic because you just got Bradbury to essentially fill that center role. So while I am totally okay with saying that Samia fills a need I mean, if you put him over at right guard, I don't know how well he's going to do, and I feel like he's just going to get run over by defenders. So this is, again, this is like where part of the Minnesota Vikings draft like confuses me a bit. I feel like there were better people on the board throughout this draft, and if they really wanted to go heavy and like secure that offensive line, they should have done that earlier than picking some of the other picks that they did and provide some more depth here. Here just because they picked Bradbury, who's going to most likely be their center. And then you have this guy who's almost going to have to play center while it provides some depth. I mean, there's some, there's some challenges here uh, in, in their pick. So a, a bit of a project here at number 114. Then at number 162, they got Cameron Smith, the inside linebacker, 
from USC, 6'2", 238 pounds. He's a great run defender, not really so great in pass coverage, but a four-year starter again, again, getting those experienced guys in the later rounds. 2015 had 45 solo tackles, 33 assists. He had one tackle for a loss, one sack, three interceptions, and three passes defended. 2016, another 45 solo tackles with 38 assists, seven for a loss, one sack, four passes defended. 2017 had 60 solo tackles, 52 assisted, 11 for a loss, half a sack, one interception, and three passes defended. And finally, in 2018, 58 solo tackles, 58 assists, seven and a half for a loss, one for a sack, and four passes defended. So while he's not going to help in the passing game whatsoever, the Vikings are basically already set in that, right? They don't need, they, they got plenty of, of pass defenders. But this guy, I feel like he's going to be a great inside linebacker. He ran a 4 6 9, 40, which is not terrible. He definitely needs some more work, but I think he's going to be able to produce for them, and I think he could produce for them. I, I think... I would be shocked if this guy doesn't make the team. One and two, I think he's going to work his way in being a starter uh, pretty early on for the Minnesota Vikings, and I think this was a really good pick for them. Then moving on to 190, Mr. Armand Watts, the defensive tackle out of Arkansas, who's 6'5", 300 pounds. Now, we were talking about how they just drafted two four-year starters, and now this guy has not been a starter until 2018. In 2018, though, he had 25 solo tackles, 24 assisted, 8.5 for a loss, 7 sacks, 2 passes defended, and 3 forced fumbles, which is impressive as hell as an interior defender. Now, he is laid off the snap, which could obviously be developed. A lot of those snap sacks were kind of gimmies, um, but he has a great body type. He has great measurables, and I think this guy could be worked into being a productive interior defender. It's just a matter of it's hard to grade him just because there's – there's not a lot of tape on him just because he only has one year of production, but I think that this is a good late round pick for the Vikings. Moving on to 191, they got Marcus Epps, the safety out of Wyoming, who's at six foot, 191 pounds, a former walk on. He's super undersized and has really short arms, and that's going to be problematic in trying to play safety in the NFL. But he had some pretty solid production. In 2015, 59 solo tackles, two interceptions, and four passes defended. 2016, 72 solo tackles, three interceptions, and six passes defended. 2017, 42 solo, four interceptions, and four passes defended. And finally, in 2018, 41 solo tackles, no interceptions, and eight passes defended. So it's going to be difficult for him to make the team just because he's so undersized as a safety. He needs to have a few more inches on him. But... He ran a 4 5 3 40 yard dash, which is okay. He had a pretty good pro day. And so I think he has a shot at making the team. It's just that the measurables aren't in his favor. Then with 193, they got Ali Udo, the tackle out of Phoenix at 6'5, 323 pounds. He's a right tackle from 2015 to 2017. Uh, he has great power, obviously at 6'5", 323, has the perfect body type for it, but this guy is the epitome of a project. He's like a tree trunk, but the guy definitely needs some work in driving back, defenders working on his feet. And so this provides more depth, and I feel like this makes more sense than their earlier pick at right guard. And so this guy, I feel like, could be beneficial on that O-line. It's just, again, it's it's going to need work. He's definitely a project. But again, once you have all these late round picks, it makes sense that these guys are going to need a lot of work. It was either they're going to get drafted or they're going to be priority free agents. Then moving on to new number 217, they got Chris Boyd, the cornerback out of Texas at 5'11", 201 pounds. A lot of people think that this is a steal. And part of me wants to agree with this. He ran a 4'4", 40 yard dash. He's definitely a zone corner. I think it'd be more beneficial if they move him to safety. He's tough. He's aggressive. He's not really great though in man coverage. And I think in certain roles, this guy is absolutely a steal. If they move him to be a zone corner or more likely be a safety, I think he could do well. In 2015, he didn't really need to do much. But in 2016, he had 42 solo tackles, an interception, and five passes defended. And then in 2017 and 18, he had over 30 tackles. He had two interceptions in 2017. And both years had 15 passes defended. So the guy knows what he's doing. I think he just, he obviously needs that, that space. He needs... That, that yardage in between him and the receiver to go and make those plays. So I think that this could be a, a starter. He just needs to work his way up to it and potentially get a position change. Then at number 239, they got Dylan Mitchell, the wide receiver out of Oregon, sitting at 6'1", 197 pounds. 
2017 had 42 receptions, 517 yards, and four touchdowns. And then 2018, 75 receptions for 1,184 yards and 10 touchdowns. So really broke out. Uh, he had a 4.46 40-yard dash. He's undersized. He has okay speed. It was 14th in the 40-yard dash, so it's really nothing special. This guy would be a project. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't see him making the team just because his speed isn't anything special. His production, while decent in Oregon for the last year, I, I don't – like, this guy doesn't impress me in any way, shape, or form. I feel like, obviously, they already have Stephon Diggs. They already have Thielen. They just got their new tight end. Like, they have plenty of wide receiver and receiving threats as a whole. Uh, I, I don't see Mitchell actually contributing a whole lot. He might just provide some competition in training camp. And then number 247, they got Ola B.C. Johnson, the wide receiver out of Colorado State, sitting at 6'0", 204 pounds. Again, another undersized guy. Ran a 4.5140 40-yard dash, which is even slower than Mitchell we were just talking about. He could make the roster just because he can play multiple uh, – he can play the slot. He Because he can play multiple positions in receiver, he can play slot. He can play the outside. Um, he's a good route runner, um, but again, I feel like this guy is also mostly just for competition um, because, again, there's nothing really special about him. 2016, he had 28 receptions for four touchdowns and 613 yards. 2017, 41 receptions for 595 and two touchdowns. And then 2018, 54 receptions for 796 yards and four touchdowns. And the entire time that he was in Colorado State, he had receivers that were better than him on the team, some that went off to get drafted into the NFL. But I feel like, again, th this is a guy who, if you're going with Mitchell or Johnson, maybe Johnson makes the team just because he's more versatile, but neither, neither of these guys are really blowing me away. But again, we're talking about the seventh round. And finally, we got Austin Cutting, the long snapper from Air Force, who's 6'3", 245 pounds. And if you remember my draft coverage from last year, I said the exact same thing that I did with our long snapper that we drafted. He snaps balls. But in reality... He had a great pro day. Uh, he also has all of the measurables that you could possibly want. But the only downside is he still has to serve two years in the Air Force. And so they're going to have to work that out with the Air Force. So that's the only potential problem they have there. And so if I had to give day three a grade, a lot of project guys, which again makes sense in the later rounds, and then some questionable picks, um, I would give this day also a B as well. And so kind of wrapping it all up and kind of summarizing it in total, I think that there's a lot of project players here, and part of that is because the amount of player, the amount of picks that they had. They somewhat addressed offensive line. There's some head-scratching picks, and again, they could have either traded up or they could have just targeted different guys uh, or stronger guys in the first and second round, really kind of building out that offensive line, which they need desperate help at, considering they just spent $84 million on Kirk Cousins. You would think that that would be the number one thing that they're going to address. They got their tight end. Again, was providing plenty of mismatch is in Alabama. I don't know how effective he's going to be in the NFL, but that's kind of a wait and see thing because he's so inexperienced. I think the the Vikings overall are already a solid team. I think that they're a better team than their record indicated last year. They have receiving threats. I don't really know what's going on at running back, if Dalvin Cook's going to be able to kind of rebound. But then again, I don't think Madison is really going to be their guy either if Dalvin Cook doesn't live up to that potential. And so I think offensive line was the most important thing here. They somewhat addressed that. Defense, they're obviously really solid. There's really no issues there. They got a great inside linebacker. So overall, I would I would give this draft a B in that I think it was it was nothing special. They filled a couple of holes, but otherwise there's no picks here that like blow me away. Like even their first rounder, there was nothing like, oh my God, like yes, that is going to immediately make a tremendous difference for the Vikings. And so uh, I'm gonna give them an overall draft grade of a B. But Vikings fans, all the other fans, let me know what you think down in the comments below. Uh, I appreciate your input. You can always find me at TomGrossyComedy.com, T-O-M-G-O-S-I-Comedy, at TomGrossyComedy, and all the social media you see down below. Check out podcasts on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play Music, and, of course, here on YouTube all the time. We'll do the Lions tomorrow, and then we'll break down undrafted free agents for the Packers on Friday. But thank you so much for watching. I'm Tom Grossy, and as always, Go Pack Go!